All right, let me invite you to turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. We are uh, continuing in our journey through the gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 10, verse 32. The title of the message this morning is called, What Do You Want Jesus to Do For You? Twice in our text this morning, that question will be asked to do different, two different sets of people. And there are two different answers. It'll be about desires of the heart. It'll be about the characteristics of the kingdom and those who would be in his kingdom, God's kingdom. But you know, in our world, when a a president, a king, or a leader passes off the scene, and when a new ruler comes on the scene, there's often conflict. There's a jockeying for position, and that's human nature. You know, the dying Alexander the Great, the great Greek conqueror, was asked by his closest collaborators about his will. How was he going to dispose of his vast empire? His closest followers gathered closer. To whom do you bequeath your kingdom, was the question. Eager to learn, they all pressed in to find out who would inherit the coveted prize. His answer, to the strongest. His dying words were a prophecy. He said this, I see a great funeral contest over me. And then he closed his eyes forever. There was a fight for his throne. Jesus' spirit is as different from the conquerors, from the rulers, from the power brokers of this world as day is from night. Position and power are the world's way. But service is the key word in the kingdom of God. Humble service. If Jesus were to ask you today, what do you want me to do for you? How would you answer? What do you want me to do for you? If Jesus asks you that question, what is your answer? Would you want position? Would you want power? Would you want possessions? What would you want Jesus to do for you? Again, he asked that question twice in our text this morning, and he'll get two different answers. Just a, a, a summary of what's gone by in the last chapter here. Remember, Jesus has been ministering for the most part in the Galilean region for two and a half, three years. We're approaching the last week or so of his life in the text this morning. He is taught that the kingdom of God must be entered into with childlike faith. He is taught that the kingdom of God is to have the highest priority even above riches, yet the rich young ruler could not pay that price. He has taught that those who entered into the kingdom of God would receive reward now in this place on the earth as well as in the life which is to come in heaven. So the kingdom of God is a major theme here. At this point in our text, Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem In about a week or so, he'll be hanging on a cross to die for the sins of the world. And there is a tension in the air. It is so thick, you could probably cut it with a knife. And so we begin, as Jesus here seeks to do the Father's will, and he'll repeat again his coming death. Mark 10, verse 32. As they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed... And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Again, he is, they, they are headed toward Jerusalem. They are headed toward the cross. And as the regular practice is, the rabbi is ahead of his followers, his disciples. That's the normal method of travel. 
He's ahead of them, and he's alone as the leader of the pack. You might ask the question, what is going through his mind? What do you think his emotions are, are at this time? What can, we, can, what can we infer from the words, Jesus was going before them? He's in front of them. He's leading them. I think we can determine that there is determination in his heart to do God's will. Knowing full well that in Jerusalem awaits the cross and the suffering. Yet if you were to lead, read Luke 9.21, it says this. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He resolved to go to Jerusalem understanding fully what the cost would be, his life. I think that's one of the things that we can know for sure. I think there also was a kind of a loneliness. He was ahead of the disciples. He's walking alone. There is perhaps a loneliness of leadership in a, having to face what he's about to face. And then thirdly, I think there could be a joy as well. A deep, settled joy that he is doing the Father's will. A joy of understanding that there's going to be a prospect of future glory, a joy of redeeming a bride for himself, a joy of bringing many sons into glory. And as Hebrews would say, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So this, I think, is his mindset. And so as we gaze upon him, he's striding in this vanguard. He is the point man. The, the followers are amazed and they are afraid. We see our intrepid leader at the front, forefront, the author and the finisher of our faith, heading towards what would ultimately be God the Father turning his back on him. Charles Erdman wrote it in this way. He says, let us pause and gaze on the face and the form of the Son of God, going with unfaltering step toward the cross. Does it not awaken in us a new heroism? as we follow? Does it not awaken new love as we see the voluntary, see how voluntary was his death for us, yet we do not wonder at the meaning and the mystery of that death? His own followers, understanding, trouble awaits in Jerusalem. They are amazed and they are afraid. You know, I I remember a feeling something similar to this. I was in my young 20s, early 20s. I'd never gone whitewater rafting before. I mean, this was serious whitewater rafting. I mean, you had to have your helmets on. You had to have a life jacket on. You had to sign a waiver. There's like six to eight people in this raft, and, and you're paddling in some points, and you're making sure you don't get thrown overboard in other points. But then the, the, the river narrowed a little bit, and here comes an a 8, 10-foot drop. And you see the people in the ship, the, the rafts before you, just going down and disappearing. And you're, you, know, you, you have the sights. You have the sound, and it, and it is amazing. And no matter what you do, you can't go backwards because the intensity and the pressure of the, of, the, of the water is pulling you forward and you're about to take the plunge. Amazed and afraid. And this is, the, this is the, the mindset of the disciples here. Jesus, knowing that trouble awaits, his death awaits, suffering awaits, Yet he sets his face like a flint. He's going to do the Father's will. And so for the third time now, he announces his coming death in the fullest sense of the word, very detailed, of all the things that will happen to him in Jerusalem. He was driving home the point, this is, this is what's going to happen. There is going to be suffering. I will be killed but every time he mentions his death, he also mentions the resurrection. But the disciples still don't get it. So after this, after he instructs them for the third time, this is what awaits me. 
The disciples don't get it, and especially James and John. Remember what they've given up so far. We have given up all. What do we get? You're going to get a reward in this life and the life which is to come. And James and John, I think, this is conjecture. This is my, my imagination, okay? Seeing Peter is starting to get to the forefront of being the spokesman of the twelve, the leader of the twelve. James and John, who are bold men, brash men, had chutzpah, they, 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 they are bold in their request that we're about to read here. We see that Jesus asked James and John what they want him to do for them. So look at verse 35 of Mark 10. We'll read to verse 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou should do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all shall you be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So we see real quickly here the request. Essentially, Jesus, in your glorious kingdom, we want to sit in places of honor right next to you. And in Matthew 20, 20, which was read during the scripture reading, we know that James and John's mother went and asked with them. If you do a little digging, you read about the relationships inside the Gospels, you will find out that their mother's name is Salome. You also find out Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. They brought Jesus' aunt with them to make the request. They were playing the family card to keep the glory in the family. But they are refused. Jesus says, look, you don't know what you're asking. He says, I don't give away the positions. Essentially, the Father gives the positions. And then a resentment arises among the other ten, most likely because they didn't ask first. Because a little later on, during the Last Supper, they will still be arguing about who is the greatest. And so Jesus uses this t tense situation as a teachable moment. As James and John are trying to secure a position in the coming kingdom, they don't see the lessons that he has just taught. Look, I'm going to die. And they're thinking about, I want to be in the right place at the right time. I want to be to the right and to the left. There were some deep-rooted messianic expectations of a conquering king, one who would help them to overthrow the yoke of the Roman Empire, one who would put Israel back on the map of the world scene. This was taught to them by their religious leaders, and they were only half right. That will happen during the second coming. But they were woefully ignorant of the Old Testament scriptures about the suffering Messiah. The conquering Messiah, yes, they understood that. The suffering Messiah, they did not. Keep your finger here and turn to Luke chapter 18, if you would. Luke chapter 18 is the other parallel passage. 
And in Luke 18, 31, we see a little bit more detail about the things that Jesus taught them about a suffering Savior. Luke 18, 31 says, Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. That's the key phrase. Let me read that again. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Here is his determination to know that he's going to go through what has been prophesied of him. What has been prophesied? Real quickly, a survey of Old Testament suffering Messiah. His enemies would rage against him, Psalm chapter 2. He would be deserted by his friends, Zechariah 11 or 13. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11 verse 12. His side would be pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. He would be beaten, his beard would be plucked out, and he would be spat upon, Isaiah 50, verse 6. His executioners would divide his garments and cast lots for his clothes, Psalm 22, 18. He would suffer an excruciating yet substitutionary death, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Yet he would rise victorious over death, Psalm 1610. He would be elevated to the Father's right hand, Psalm 110, verse 1. The disciples weren't getting the message of the suffering Savior, or at least they didn't want to hear it. Remember, they had left everything to follow him, and they wanted something in return. Again, a week later at the Last Supper, they would argue about who would be the greatest in Luke chapter 22. So Jesus asked them, can you drink of the cup and the baptism that I'm, gonna, that I'm going to experience? And a prideful answer, we can. And then to me, like an unexpected response, you will. You will drink of the cup. You will experience the baptism. Again, these are references to suffering. The cup for Jesus would be paying the price of the cup of God's wrath against him or against human sin upon him. He would become a ransom for many, as Mark 10, 10 declares. Their cup, their baptism, would be suffering and persecution, which they would experience as witnesses for him. But what pride, what ignorance about what would befall them. So James, out of that pair, that, those brothers, James would be executed by Herod, Herod Agrippa, the first martyr to be killed for Christ. John would be the last of the apostles to die. He would suffer persecution. He would be banished on an island to suffer isolation. He would suffer the loneliness of old age. He would be the last to fight or to stand against increasing apostasy. Legend says that he was also boiled in oil yet survived. Would they take of the cup? Would they drink of the cup of suffering? Absolutely, they did. And then to find out that the positions in the kingdom are doled out by the Father and not the Son. And so the response of the ten, they are, they are incensed. <laughs> so Jesus uses this tense situation to reteach what greatness is in the kingdom. Worldly greatness versus greatness in the kingdom. Jesus makes a contrast here. Worldly greatness, the leaders and the rulers of this world, the culture in which they lived and what they aspired to, what they expected were rulers that would exercise lordship and dominion. That is, they would, they, they, they would exercise authority over them. They would be ambitious. They would be arrogant. They would be all types of 
forceful, negative, domineering, dictatorial, prideful leadership in the kingdoms of this world is what they were used to. But Jesus makes a contrast and flips that upside down on its head and says, no, that's not what my kingdom is about. My kingdom will be about voluntary, self-sacrificing service. That is greatness in the kingdom. Again, they're concerned about position and prominence, but Jesus says, no, in my kingdom, there's going to have to be a willingness to serve and a willingness to suffer. (laughs) You know, from the world's perspective, we're we're thinking, wow, that's not something I want. But that's the characteristic of the kingdom that Jesus will establish. The world seeks to be served, but Jesus says the greatest in my kingdom will seek to be a servant and a slave of all. In fact, look back down in Mark chapter 10, verse 43. This is what leadership will look like in my kingdom. In Mark 10, 43, it says, Jesus is speaking. He says, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Okay, the word minister in verse 43 comes from the Greek word diakonos, where we get our English word deacon or serve or servant. If you're going to be great in my kingdom, you're going to be a servant. And if you're going to be the greatest in my kingdom, look at verse 44. And whosoever you will be the chiefest, the greatest, shall be the servant of all. That word servant in this passage, this part of the verse, is a different Greek word. That word is doulos. That word means slave. If you're going to be the greatest in my kingdom, you're going to be a slave. So anybody who seeks to be in his kingdom and to serve, guess what? You are to consider everyone else your master. And you are to be a slave of all. Again, from the human perspective, that's a hard sell. But that's exactly what Jesus says the characteristics of his kingdom shall be. And then he gives the ultimate example of someone who is like that. Verse 45, himself. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The word ransom there has the idea of a price paid to effect a release of prisoners or captives. It's a redemption price. This is the redemption price that was paid to God in full. All those who believe it will experience the freedom of salvation and the freedom from sin that Jesus offers. That ransom will be paid in full at the cross. It also includes the concept or the idea of substitution. People are captives. They're enslaved under the power of sin and death from which they cannot free themselves. They can't get out of it. But Jesus' substitutionary death paid that price to set those people free. So he concludes that lesson of the kingdom. It is about service. What do you want me to do for you? Do you know what you're asking? You're going to be servants and slaves of all. Yet, He moves on. Jerusalem is calling. After crossing the Jordan River from Perea, that's the east side of the Jordan River, when Galileans and pilgrims would come down from the north to go to Jerusalem for Passover week, they would avoid Samaria. So they're on the other side of the Jordan River on Perea. Now they're crossing back over the river to go to Jericho and then eventually to Jerusalem. And we see that in verse 45 or verse 46 of Mark chapter 10, where we run into a blind man named Bartimaeus, where he will ask that same question. What do you want me to do for you? Let's look at verse 46 of Mark 10. And they came to Jericho, 
And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, okay, a great number of people would probably be the pilgrims coming from the north. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out, he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith, have made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So the second time the question in this text is asked, what do you want me to do for you? And a totally different answer. We have Bartimaeus here, a blind man. He had probably heard of Jesus' stories of uh, healings. The lame being made to walk, the blind being made to see, the deaf being made to hear, the mute being made to talk. He had heard Because Jericho is a up-and-coming city. It is it is it is a a thriving city. It's a crossroads city. And he hears the stories of Jesus, Jesus' miracles and his healings. And now as Jesus he hears that Jesus is passing by, hope arises. It's him. You know. When you're blind, your other senses start to, you know, pick up for or try to make up for one of your lost senses, and no doubt his hearing is impeccable. He could tell the difference between a child walking on on gravel and an adult. He could hear from the distance certain animals, different voices, different people that he would recognize by voice. But now, today is something different. Yeah, the regular traffic coming through the area he recognized, but there seemed to be something different in the air and he knows it's because of Jesus. And he is relegated, as most blind people were in that day, to be a beggar. He was begging for money or for food, but today he will beg for mercy because the Son of God is passing by. And in his request or in his call, he says, Jesus... Thou son of David, have mercy on me. In this statement, he recognizes the messianic title. He recalled the divine promises that were given to David, King David, in 2 Samuel 8, and also to Abraham. He doesn't call him Jesus, thou Nazarene. He says, Jesus, thou son of David. And according to 2 Samuel chapter 8, the Messiah would be David's greater son the heir to the throne. And so in this confession is a faith that this would-be king would also fulfill the promise of Abraham of David. He is the Messiah. He is a descendant of David. Mary and Joseph were descendants of David. And Bartimaeus knew that Jesus was offering himself as the Messiah of Israel. And the Bible had predicted that the Messiah, in Isaiah 35, 5, would open the eyes of the blind. So here is hope arising, faith coming out of the heart and out of the mouth. Have mercy on me! He had the eyes of faith. A person has to recognize a need before that need could be met. And so he is insistent here. He cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, at least two times. The plea comes from the depths of his heart, from his great need. Begging for mercy implies this. It implies that he is guilty. Old Testament theology. You know, most people have sin because, most people have these illnesses, blindness, deafness, or whatever because of sin in their life. Someone sinned. 
Either way, he recognizes that he was a sinner. And in pleading for mercy, he acknowledges he deserves punishment because he is a sinner, but he pleads for mercy. He saw the light of truth before he saw the light of day. He was insistent. He was persistent. Many told him to stop, to be quiet. He would not be, he would not be waylaid. He would not be detracted. He ignored them. He kept crying, Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, there is a sense in which all people should understand that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a sense when, which all people, as Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent taketh it by force. That means, listen, you should be pressing and striving in to get to the kingdom. Striving to enter in at that narrow gate. And here is a blind man, knowing his weaknesses, knowing his shortcomings, is striving and no one is going to stop him to get to the presence of the king. He's persistent. He strives to enter in. And then, anytime a sinner looks up to God for mercy, God will give special attention to. As one commentator said, deity was stopped in its tracks because of sinner's call for mercy. Jesus stops. He commands him to be brought forth. We see that God stops for those who call upon him for mercy. Bartimaeus acts in faith without hesitation. He casts off his beggar's garment, leaves everything behind, and moves forward. Whether he was cheered on, you know, someone held his hand, or, and I, I imagine him just pressing people out of the way, going toward the voice. And then we have that phrase that Jesus asked in the, in the singular here. He asked it in the plural, James and John. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man says unto him in verse 51, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Matthew mentions that there were two blind men. Mark here just concentrates on the one, probably the most verbal. And he calls him Lord, Rabboni in, 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 the, in the Greek. His physical and his spiritual eyes are opened. He's using this title and placing himself under the lordship, under the submission of this new master and lord. And one man said it in this way, he is a man of gratitude. Having received a sight, he followed Jesus. He did not selfishly go on his way when his need was met. He began with need, and he went on with gratitude, and he finished with loyalty. And that is a perfect summary of the stages of discipleship. Here is a pattern for unbelievers. Call upon God for mercy. And with mercy comes gratitude and a willingness to live and follow Jesus Christ. You know, we don't know how long Bartimaeus was blind, but we see it was just one instance, one minute that it took for him to turn to Jesus. One decision. Throughout the passages we've covered so far, we see that there are the religious leaders who are willfully blind. They would not see. Here's a blind man who wanted to see, and he was given his sight. In coming to Jesus, as I close here, you do, do not let anything, any man, any circumstance to stop you. Press toward into the straight and the narrow way, the gate of Jesus Christ. If you come into him with faith, he will heal your soul and forgive your sin. Bartimaeus knew his desperate condition. He knew his great need. Do you recognize your condition? Do you recognize your own spiritual blindness? Are you willing to leave everything behind and respond to faith in Christ? Today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, that is the manner and the model that is given. Pressing into the kingdom, not letting man, not letting circumstances, not letting anything stop you from placing your faith in Jesus Christ and living for him. Now, if you're here today and if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you know him as your savior, 
I want to encourage you to do this thing. There was a medical missionary. He performed surgery on a poor blind man and restored his sight. Sometime after the operation, that man disappeared. Then a few days later, the medical missionary opened his door, and there was the man with a rope. On that rope were ten more blind people. If you've received the grace of God and the forgiveness of God, bring more of the blind that they might receive spiritual sight. Being a servant means being a witness. If you're here today and you're on a journey, we all are. Jesus was on a journey to certain death to Jerusalem, yet he knew it was the Father's will. Whatever journey you're on, Jesus is with you and is willing to hear you and guide you if you let him. Many people do not come to Jesus because they don't feel a need for him. Do you recognize that you're spiritually blind and need spiritual sight? Are you willing to leave everything that you might follow him? That question, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Does it include service? Are you serving in the kingdom? If not, find a place to serve. You say, I want to be a better Christian. If Jesus asked me that question, what do you want me to do for you? If you say, I want to be a better Christian, serve. You say, I want to be a better spouse, serve. Serve your wife, serve your husband. You say, I want to be a better employee or worker, serve. You say, I want to be a better per parent, serve. Serve your children. Teach them what God says. Train them in the way they should go. Because the truth is, Jesus still says, what do you want me to do for you? Ask, and you will receive. Seek and you shall find. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace, the goodness of the grace that you bestow upon your people. We thank you for the example that is given, that you gave your life in service, that we ought also serve you with our lives by serving others. True greatness is a willingness to suffer and serve in your kingdom. Help us be true and great servants of your Son. If you're here today and you do want me to pray for you, say, Pastor, I don't know what it means to be in the kingdom of God. I don't even know what I don't know. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not certain that I'm a child of God. I'm not certain if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Please, Pastor, pray for me. Raise your hand nice and high, and I will pray for you. If you want to respond to me later, you can talk to me. We can, we can set up an appointment, and we can set aside some time to talk about being in the kingdom of God. And those of you who are here and, and need to find a place of service, there are many places to serve. Just open your eyes and serve. God, again, we do thank you for being in your house today. We thank you for the, the gospel. We thank you for the great salvation we have in Jesus Christ. Help us to live for him and for his glory. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please stand with me, and Steve will come and lead us in a final song.